Psalm 24. And that will be our study this morning in the Bible class. We'll first of all read these ten verses that comprise this psalm and then spend some time with some background on it and then the text itself in some lessons that we can glean uh, from it. This psalm begins, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and has established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol nor sworn to seek he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, lift up your everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. A portion of this psalm is messianic and prophetic, and those last uh, four verses, 7, 8, 9, and 10, are the prophetic part of that psalm, and we'll talk about that in just a few moments. But as we go back to the beginning of it, in terms of some background, there is some important background information concerning this psalm because it is believed to be a psalm of David. There's no reason to deny that David was the author of it. But the occasion for the writing of this psalm by David, of course writing it by inspiration, of course, is an interesting occasion and provides some very important lessons for us in that regard. It is said that this psalm was written upon returning the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem after a, a long period of time. When you go to 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 15, you see the, uh, the background of this in terms of the occasion that uh, prompted the writing of this, uh, of this psalm. And, of course, David was... Uh, uh, was extremely pleased about it in 2 Samuel 6. In fact, he was, uh, he was dancing and jumping around uh, to express his joy over the Ark of the Covenant being brought back to Jerusalem. And of course, you remember the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, we're introduced to the Ark of the Covenant back in Moses' time when the tabernacle was constructed and you had the, uh, the holy place and the most holy place, of course, and in that most holy place, you had the Ark of the Covenant, where the presence of God was manifested and where, he, uh, where the high priest would enter once a year to offer sacrifices, uh, burn incense, and offer uh, for the people and for himself. Well, in 1 Samuel chapter 6, we read an account where the Ark of the Covenant had been taken captive by the Philistines during the battle there. And they captured the ark. Of course, it didn't work out too well for them. God plagued them tremendously. In fact, he plagued them so much that they said, we got to take this thing back. And so they uh, put it on a cart and sent it back uh, to uh, Beth Shemesh. And uh, then uh, there were those who looked into the ark and should not have done so and were uh, struck by God on that occasion for violating his will. And so the ark then rested in the uh, house of Abinadab uh, on that occasion for a long time. In fact, 20 years, uh, the ark of the covenant stayed there in the house of Abinadab. Well, then David, in 2 Samuel, he uh, decides to bring it up to the city of David, to Jerusalem. And uh, they brought it out of the house of, uh, of uh, Abinadab. Uh, which was on the hill accompanying the ark of God and Ohio, an individual named Ohio, went before the ark and uh, David and all the house, uh, the text says there in verse uh, for, uh, 2 Samuel 6, played music before the Lord, of course, and, and they came to Nacon's threshing floor and it was there, you remember, a man named Uzzah reached out to steady the ark that was on a cart 
Well, what was the problem in the first place? The ark should not have been on the cart to begin with because the Kohathites, the sons of Kohath, part of the tribe of Levi, they had been specified to uh, carry it on staves that uh, they carried it on, the, on their shoulders. So they violated the will of God in transporting the ark the way they did. And uh, then when Uzzah reached out to steady it, he was struck dead. Oh, well, David was angered by that. He couldn't understand why that had happened. Uh, he later did, but he didn't uh, at the time. And uh, so then he was afraid to bring the ark on into Jerusalem. And so they turned aside and left the ark in the house of Obed-Edom for three months. And it stayed there for three months. And then David, realizing, of course, that they had uh, done wrong in the method they had used to bring it, then did it the right way and had the Kohathites uh, carry it, and they brought it on in to uh, to Jerusalem. Well, obviously there are some very powerful lessons to be learned from all of those mistakes that were made. God means what he says and says what he means, and when he said he wanted the Kohathites to bear the ark in a certain way and do it that way, he meant that. Now one could say, well, Uzzah, all Uzzah was trying to do was to uh, do the right thing and keep the ark from, uh, from falling. Well, it wouldn't have fallen if it had been on the shoulders of the Kohathites in the first place. Uh, carried it the way they should have. And there's no question about the fact that Uzzah was completely sincere in his motive for what he did. But what does that tell us about sincerity? It tells us that sincerity alone is not sufficient uh, to please God. That we need to have a sincere heart and attitude, of course. Uh, God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship in spirit. That's attitude and in truth. But in truth means worship the way he has said to worship. And under that old covenant, carrying the ark or transporting the ark was to be done a specific, uh, specific way. And we have example after example in the Old Testament that tells us that God has always said what he meant, meant what he said. Uh, you go all the way back to the first uh, occasion of worship in Genesis chapter 4, and that, uh, Cain and Abel obviously had been told by God what to offer in sacrifice to him. And Abel complied and Cain did not. And again, we would not assume that Cain was not sincere. In fact, uh, we have every reason to believe he was sincere because he was shocked when his uh, sacrifice was rejected. And, uh, and yet it was. Why? Because it was not in harmony with what God had specified. And of course, we have example after example throughout the Old Testament. But this is another classic example of where sincerity alone did not suffice. And Uzzah uh, was struck down. Then, David came to his senses about it and realized this is the way we need to take it to Jerusalem, and so they did. Well, that brings us to this occasion of the writing of Psalm 24. It is believed that it, this was written upon his returning the ark to Jerusalem, as we have that account in 2 Samuel chapter 6. But the psalm itself uh, breaks down in such a way as to uh, provide for us some very important reminders about uh, some very important subjects. First of all, uh, creation and uh, the fact that the earth, as the psalm begins, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. We are what? We're just stewards. We don't, we don't own anything. And this is one of many, many statements in Scripture, Old and New Testament alike, that should remind us that everything belongs to God. He created it. He created it through Jesus Christ, remember? You go to John chapter 1, in the beginning uh, was the Word, that's capital W, Jesus as the Word, the eternal Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, that is the eternal word who became Christ uh, on earth, Jesus, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And uh, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And so uh, all things were created by God, but it was Christ as the member of the Godhead, the eternal word, 
that was the agent of creation. So when we say all things were made by God, and even though we know that is Christ who made all things, he is God, isn't he? Remember when the rich young ruler came to him and said, Good master, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God. But what was he doing? He was affirming, I am God. I am deity. I am deity. So the earth is the Lord's and its fullness. The world, in other words, all of the physical creation was made by God. You go back to Genesis chapter 1. And in the beginning, what? God created the heavens and the earth. And uh, then we go through that uh, creation account in chapter 1 and in chapter uh, 2. And it was perfect. Everything was perfect. In fact, you have the word good six times in chapter 1 of Genesis. And then in verse 31 of Genesis 1, you have God looking upon all that he had made. And behold, it was very good. It was very good. So the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world, but also not just the things, the physical creation, but those who dwell therein. And so God uh, is the creator of not just the physical creation, the things, but man himself. Go back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Remember, God said, let us, and that word us is there for a reason, it's plural because the word God there is plural, three members of the Godhead. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And yes, God said, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all uh, the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the face of the earth. Verse 27, so God created man, how? In his own image, in his image uh, of God, the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created uh, them. And so, God here, the psalmist reminds us, is the one who has founded this world upon the seas, established it upon uh, the waters. Because again, establishing it upon the waters may be a reference to the fact that he lifted the land, as it were, out of, out of the uh, the seas, because remember verse 2 of Genesis chapter 1, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and then there was that separation that God made, founded it upon the sea. So initially the indication is you have a lot of water, and then God uh, founded the land, lifting the land as it were, by what? By fiat, by his voice, by saying uh, these uh, various aspects bringing them into existence by speaking them into existence. And incidentally, that tells us how will they, how will these things go out of existence in the same way uh, by the voice uh, of God when he decides uh, to take it all away. So this we're reminded of, and oh, don't we wish <laughs> indeed that mankind as a whole would recognize that he is just but a steward of all of this. But... For the most part, man gets the other impression and has the other impression uh, continually. This is me, mine. It's all about me and what I can accumulate and so forth. I, uh, and that we should not be so attached to the things of this world because we're just stewards of it and we're going to, we're going to ultimately give it all up. I don't care how much you accumulate in this life, you will not Take it with you, will you? And I mean, that expression's been around a lot longer than I have, <laughs> is that you can't take it with you. Or the old expression, there are no pockets in a shroud. I guess they used to bury people in shrouds, and so they didn't have pockets. Well, why not? There's no point in having pockets. No point in having uh, pockets. You can't, uh, you can't take it with you. There's some story about a lady whose husband said when he died, he wanted all of his money to be put in the casket uh, with him and so she complied by having all of it in the casket initially but when it came time to close the casket and bury him she wrote a check for that same amount put it in the casket took the money out <laughs> and left him with a check <laughs> but uh, because you can't take it with you no matter what form uh, it is in you are not going to uh, not going to take it with you I love what the late Leroy Brownlow uh, wrote about this 
in, uh, in his book, The Psalm in My Heart, where he has a different psalm for every day. It's a great little devotional book. But he wrote this uh, concerning these first two verses of Psalm 24. He said, How deceived we are in our attachment to materials. We call them ours when they are not. The wealthiest and most powerful holder is but a tenant who may at any moment receive notice to vacate. And with the notice comes the revealing question in Luke 12, 20. Who shall these things be which thou hast provided? And of course you remember in Luke chapter 12 where Jesus was approached by a man who said, Master, make, make my brother divide his inheritance with me. And, and uh, Jesus was not going to get involved with that. And he used, he used that occasion, remember? He used that occasion to say, Therefore take heed and beware of covetousness. And then he gave the parable in Luke chapter 12. And what was the parable? The parable of the rich fool who did what? said, I've got so many goods, I need to tear down my barns and build uh, bigger barns, and I'll say to my soul, so you have many goods laid up for many years, take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry, but what? But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you, and then that question, then whose will those things be which you have provided? Then Jesus drives the lesson home in verse 21 of Luke 12 when he says, So is he who what? Who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich for God. And that reminds us of Matthew 6, 24. Uh, no man can serve two masters. For either you hate the one, love the other, and you'll be loyal to the one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And you go back to verse 19 of that text. He says, do not, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consume and where thieves do not break in and steal. Then he adds, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And I made the statement, I think, here that no one will go to heaven whose heart is not already there. In other words, it's not money you're sending ahead. It's your heart that has to be in heaven. Now, one could say the only money you can ever see again, not literally, is the money you give to the Lord because as you give to the Lord, you are adding to your heavenly account if you're giving as you should. That's true. But it's not going to be literal money. Uh, in fact, remember the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4 was uh, complimenting the uh, Philippian brethren because they had uh, met his financial needs, his material needs, time and time again. And listen to what he wrote in verse 15, beginning of Philippians 4. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica you said aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the gift that abounds to your account. In other words, what you're giving to me is going to abound to your heavenly account because you will be uh, rewarded as a result of your generosity. And so that's a principle that we need to appreciate. So in the first part of this 24th Psalm, we are indeed... Uh, reminded, reminded about the fact that the Lord owns everything. We're but stewards of it, and certainly we're not going to be able to take it with us. The only reward we'll see uh, from money here is the money we send on ahead, so to speak. Then in verses uh, 3 and 4, the question is posed. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy? Place. Now this is in a, this is the equivalent of really asking who is it that's going to be acceptable in his or her worship to God? Uh, who can stand before Him? Who can who can stand before Him uh, and be approved? 
And it's really very similar in uh, content to Psalm 15. Go back a few pages to, in your Bible to Psalm 15 and listen to the question with which Psalm 15 begins. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? So when you look at the question in verse 3 of Psalm 24, it's very similar to that, isn't it? Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? Psalm 15, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? Both questions really are the equivalent of asking who can be pleasing to you, God, in worship to you and in service to you. Now, the answer back in Psalm 15 he who work, walks uprightly, works righteousness, speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eye is a vile person in despise, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. He who does not put out his money at usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be removed. I have a whole series of lessons on Psalm 15, actually, that I preached, and we might uh, come back to that psalm uh, one of these days, too. But it's, uh, it's a little more detailed in the response there than what we have here in Psalm 24, but very similar. So here's the answer in verse 4 beginning. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. So that's a more succinct uh, summary, if you will, than we have in Psalm 15, but very, very similar. But notice, notice he divides it, the answer is divided here really into two parts, clean hands and a pure heart. When you think about hands, what do you generally connote um, with hands? Work. Doing something with your hands, in other words, doing something with your hands. And when you think about the pure heart, you think more about attitude, don't you? More about the inward or the spiritual. And so uh, it's very, very much a summary here of the right attitude and the right action. Clean hands means the work that you are doing, the activity in which you are involved with the hands. That work is clean. In other words, it's what God directs you to do. Not what you think you ought to do, but what God has told you to do. And you do it from a pure heart. Well, it gets back again to John, uh, John 3, 16, doesn't it? The golden text. God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Clean hands, that's truth. Pure heart, that's spirit. God has always determined and de desired and demanded that we have what? Clean hands and a pure heart. In other words, that our actions and our attitudes are in harmony with each other. Well, what does that say then about those who are worshiping God sincerely today, but not with clean hands? Meaning, they are not worshiping according to the New Testament uh, pattern. Well, you go ahead, look at the latter part of verse 4. The next line, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol? Is it not the case that those who are not worshiping according to the New Testament pattern, no matter how sincere they may be, are in effect lifting up their souls to an idol? Well, I don't think there's any doubt about it. It's not a pleasant thought, but it cannot be deny it. When you think about the latter part of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7 verse 21, not everyone who says to me Lord, Lord, that's sincerity shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who what? Who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. There's your activity. Activity according to what? The will of the Father in heaven. And then he goes on there in that context to say many will say to me in that day Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Are these religious people here? Well, of course they are. Have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name? Done money wonders in your name? 
false miracles, pseudo miracles, and you've got a bunch of that going on right here, don't you, in our day and time, and have for quite some time. And it's very descriptive. This passage is very descriptive of what we have today with those who think that miracles can be performed and that they can cast out demons and so forth. And they may be sincere and self-deluded. No question. In fact, in 2 Thessalonians 2, God says, they are determined to believe a lie and I will send them a strong delusion. In other words, I will allow them. I'll allow them. If they're going to be determined to go that way, I'll allow them. I'm not going to force them uh, in another direction. So, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who what? Who practice lawlessness. The lawlessness would be equivalent to our passage here in verse 4, lifting up one's soul to another. So, clean hands means the work that we are to do is to be the work that God has set forth for us in His Word. And it also reminds us of something else that's very important, and what is that? Work is a part of pleasing God. And there are those, as we have said before, who vehemently deny that work has anything at all to do with your salvation, and that baptism is a work, and therefore baptism cannot be essential to salvation. Well, baptism is a work of faith, but all works of faith are essential, the ones that are outlined in God's Word. And time and time again, uh, works are exalted in the New Testament as being absolutely essential to our salvation. And so, and many passages could be cited to, to show that. So, clean hands and pure heart really summarizes the need for the right attitude and the right uh, actions and the right words. Because you look then at nor, nor sworn deceitfully. Those who have clean hands, pure heart, not false, not worshiping false uh, in a false way, nor sworn deceitfully. So our words are vitally important. And what does this remind us of? An old statement that has been mentioned many times about the time long ago when a man's what? Word was his bond. Right. Uh, that's really what you have here that's being, uh, that's being uh, admonished here is for us to speak truthfully and be people of our word who can be uh, counted upon. So there's the summary, and it's a beautiful summary, in answer to the question of verse 3. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who, in other words, who can worship God acceptably? And that is, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol or sworn to seekful. Now, again, it's interesting that Brother Brownlow, in another statement on these verses, makes a beautiful statement, I think, and I want to share that uh, with you. His point in this statement I'm about to read is that God has demands of His people, and, um, and they are demands that come from a holy God, from a holy God. And that's what we should expect from a holy God. Listen to what he writes. He says, God maintains a holy place and only those with clean hands and a pure heart can ascend its heights then he adds thank god for this thank god for this and then here's how he explains that for it would weaken and cheapen us for him to make no demands of us to do this would reduce him to the role of an overindulgent grandfather who hurts his offspring by spoiling them. And that's the picture that many people have of God. They view him as an overindulgent grandfather who would just basically put up with whatever we decide we want to give him. And that he'll accept that. Because God is so good. God is so good. And he is. But he's also perfect in justice. And he is a holy God. And as a holy God, in a holy place, He demands that there are certain things that we comply with in order to approach Him. 
But aren't we thankful that we can approach him? And there'd be no way for us to do so had it not been for Jesus Christ. Because he, we, we had to have that perfect mediator. We had to have that perfect high priest. But we do. And because we do, have one who's been tempted at all points as we are, yet without sin, as the Hebrews writer tells us, we can through him approach God, but not without meeting the demands that God has for us in order to <coughs> approach Him. And are those demands too rigid and too strict to comply with? Of course not. God would never, because He is a loving God who is good, He would never demand of us something that we're not capable of giving. Never. So I, again, I really appreciate what the late Leroy Brown was said about those uh, about those verses. And then verse 5, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. In other words, the righteousness, he will be viewed as being right. Uh, the late guy in Woods said the best definition he ever could come up with for righteousness is just doing right. <laughs> righteousness is just doing right. And God tells us how to do right and blesses us with righteousness when we do right. In other words, He deems us what? Righteous. He views us as righteous. And we can accept that knowing that we've complied with His revealed will and therefore we have what? Peace and hope and the greatest comfort that we can have. This is Jacob. Uh, some margins put this is the God of Jacob, the generations of those who seek him. But it may simply be this is Jacob, meaning true Israel, the true Israel, uh, as Jacob, as Jacob ultimately came to be a follower of God and completely embrace God. This is, uh, this is what it takes to be in that same camp, so to speak. Then, finally, in just a few minutes we have, let's just look briefly at these last four uh, verses. This is the prophetic aspect of this psalm. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors. And it said here that this configuration may have been the idea of doors to the gate, but then you had a grate uh, above the gate on pulleys that could be lowered and would keep you from penetrating the doors of the gate, whatever they were. So in other words, you had, you had it's kind of like having bars on your window. I guess it's the idea that I, I got from this and researching this. But the idea is that, that there's security here, but there's a call here to open the gates and the doors. And who will come in? And, and, of course, initially, this may have referred to primarily and immediately what? The gates of Jerusalem. Lift up your gates and the Ark of the Covenant is coming in. Because remember, we said this psalm is believed to have been written at the time they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant back into uh, Jerusalem. But the prophetic ultimate fulfillment would not be with the Ark of the Covenant, but with the King of Glory. Who is this King of Glory? That's the question that comes back from, as it were, from within the city, the citizens. The citizens are saying, well, who is this King of Glory that we're to open for? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, again. Lift up your everlasting doors and the King of Glory. And then again, the question, who is this King of Glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of Glory. Well, to what is this belief to be referring to in terms of uh, prophecy? The ascension, the ascension of Christ after his resurrection. When you go back to the book of Daniel in chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, and of course uh, sermons uh, after Pente on Pentecost and after Pentecost speak of the fact that Christ has been what? elevated to the right hand of God, He is on the throne, etc. Uh, and then the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit was given to the apostles on Pentecost, etc. But the prophecy of the ascension goes all the way back to Daniel, chapter 7, 
Listen to verses 13 and 14. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, that would be the Father, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. And so, verses 7 through 10 are believed to be prophetic, referring to that point in time when Jesus followed his resurrection, uh, there in Acts 1, when the disciples watched him ascend, and Daniel 7, 13 and 14 was fulfilled, when he came to the Ancient of Days, and he was given, what? Glory. He was restored to the glory that he had before uh, he came to this earth. And John 17, in his prayer to the Father, that was the first part of that prayer. He said, restore the glory which I had with you. And uh, so he is the king of glory. When did he become the king of glory? He did not become the king of glory until he ascended. Therefore, this has to be ultimately a prophecy about the fulfillment of that receiving the kingdom when he came to the Father. And really it's been said that Psalm 22, 23, and 24 should be studied together because they are messianic uh, in nature, all of them to some extent. But here we're dealing with the uh, with the ascension back to the Father in heaven. So this psalm is a, a wonderful psalm in many ways from the standpoint of the lessons we can glean from it, including, including in these last verses, the important lesson that this book could not have been written by uninspired men. It had to be inspired because it's so full of prophecies that could not have been given except by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. How in the world did Daniel, in Daniel 7, in his time, speak of the ascension of Christ and be a clear reference to his ascension uh, unless he did so by inspiration? And uh, I may have mentioned that years ago, Janice ran across an uh, internet story about a fellow who'd been a devout atheist and was known by everyone around him to be uh, one of the most valid, one of the strongest atheists that you could have. And ultimately, tragically, he didn't become a New Testament Christian. He thinks he was obeyed the gospel, but uh, of course he did so by the very popular sinner's prayer method. But that being said, nonetheless, he said the book of Daniel was the key. He said, I could not get around the fact that there's no way that everything in the book of Daniel that's prophetic, and there's much that is, could possibly have been written without the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the existence of God has to be there. And really, you know, when you go back to the first verse of this psalm, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. All we have to do is look around and see that there's no way that evolution could possibly be, uh, be true. You look at the intricacies of the human body and think that all of that evolved. I mean, you look at, you know, Janice just had hip replacement surgery and yet as advanced and, you know, as wonderful as all that is, there's still things that she can, has to never do again. You know, it's not a big deal, like crossing one leg over another and with that leg that has the hip. Could she do that with the hip God gave her? Yes, until it deteriorated. Can she do it with the one man has designed and made? No. Why not? Because it's not as good. And then I'm to believe that evolution accounted for that first one that was better than this one? That's ridiculous. <laughs> it's really ridiculous. And that's just one example of hundreds upon hundreds that can be cited. Not only from the standpoint of the human body, but from creation itself. And yet, Man, for the most part, won't look at it. I think I may have also mentioned that the late Thomas Warren in his debate with the most well-known leading atheist of his uh, day 
um, argued for, of course, the creation, and, and uh, this atheist, who was the leading atheist of his day, Anthony Flew, uh, Anthony Flew argued against it, but Anthony Flew, though he never became a Christian, before he died, he did admit, I cannot deny that there has to be an intelligent designer for the design. Now, what was it that put him over the edge to believe that? DNA. Ultimately, it was DNA. And everything that we've discovered about DNA, he said, it's impossible. It's impossible. Again, the intricacies of the human body. He said, it's just impossible. So he had to ultimately admit that there is an intelligent designer behind the obviously intelligent design. Well, I believe our time is gone. Appreciate your good attention.